Well, thank you very much, everyone, and, and for you all who, who remember Monty Python now for something completely different. Uh, we have seen some terrific presentations about the coming digital, about the imperative to innovate. Uh, what I would like to talk to you about today is what is going on with mobile apps. And it's going to be pretty granular, a lot of data-driven charts. Uh, but for those of you who are wondering, what are my competitors doing and how should I be thinking about what to offer, uh, we'll have some interesting answers for you, I think. So let me take you through what the shape of the conversation will, will be like today. And if you've got questions, you know, holler. There are a lot of interesting things that arise from all of this. So we'll, we'll start with the mobile context uh, and then talk to you about what's happening with mobile banking at credit unions and banks uh, with some comparisons and contrasts. Uh, mobile adoption and how many financial institutions are actually offering mobile. Um, and just as a show of hands here, how many of your credit unions actually have a mobile app? Okay, that's very gratifying. Uh, not everyone does. Uh, we'll talk about how customers are actually using it, and there's a surprise there. Mobile features that are currently being offered, not nearly as prevalent as you might think. Uh, what features tend to be associated with more mobile usage? Customer satisfaction uh, on banks and credit unions. Uh, what's going on in the market share of some of the key vendors out there? And finally, some high-level advice for you all as you think about where to go on the mobile journey. So. Mobile context, this is some research that we have done um, with 100, over 100, uh, in this case 112 answered this question, financial institutions in North America overall. And what we found when we said, what is your top strategic retail banking priority today? What we found is 70% said that their number one or two priority was customer relationships. And What's so surprising about this is that for the last six years that we've asked this, it has been sales results as the number one strategic priority. And we just did this survey in December. So we were very gratified to see that it actually turned out this way because anecdotally in our conversations with our clients, um, half of whom are banks and credit unions and half of whom are service providers, this was an emerging theme. So seeing it borne out by the data was great. Now sales results is still important, but that's a pretty distant number two at 41%. And I've been asked before about regulatory compliance and fraud and risk management. Uh, there's certainly a big area of spend. Uh, they're an area of focus. But as a strategic priority, something that is going to move the needle, they're not really up there. And again, we think that's right and appropriate. Now we then asked, what is it that helps you, technologically wise, get to where you're going with your strategic priorities? And again, not surprisingly, 96%, which is an unheard of number in a survey like this, said mobile banking channel development. So for institutions around the country, this is a big deal. Omni-channel delivery, closely tied to this, comes in number two. Customer journey, measuring it and optimizing it, third. And then personalization and analytics and branch channel transformation. Further down the list, uh, are open APIs and middle and office and core. So not all that popular. What was kind of interesting, and I always do like to look at what's at the bottom, was AI. And so for folks like JP and me and, and all sorts of folks looking really forward, AI is top of mind right now. But for people who are actually running banks and trying to get through all this other stuff, AI is way down on their priority list. Yeah, it's cool, but it is not as important today because they've got to really run the bank. And, and we think that kind of reality check is, is pretty helpful. So yeah, keep an eye on it, uh, but it, and, and it may be a way for you to differentiate yourself, but for the vast majority of folks, it's not an issue today. We also were very curious about why is it that firms are investing in digital? Do they have a coherent and convincing and compelling rationale. And yeah, they're kind of all over the place. None of these is really differentiated. Um, investing to keep up with the competition, that's, that's kind of a hold your nose answer. It's not that satisfying, I gotta say. Improving customer relationships, I like that a lot better. That's a lot more compelling. 
um, attracting new customers and upselling through the mobile channel. That's good, and we have some data on, on how that's happening. Uh, differentiating the institution with better capabilities and user experience, again, pretty good. And migrating from the, chance, uh, the branch channel to save expense, I, I buy that, and it's, it's not the highest by any means. So a wide variety of rationales, not terribly differentiated. So we're also very curious about this notion of selling digitally. How many of you all can, uh, are, are able to open an account online? Not mobile, just online. Okay, not bad. How about via mobile? Oh, pretty good. So here's the data here, and there's been a lot of progress in the last two years since we last asked this. For the, the bigs, over 50 billion in assets, 80% now lets you do that, um, lets you sell or originate new products digitally, up from a third two years ago. It was kind of surprising, frankly, to us that in this one to $50 billion range, there's not been very much progress in a couple of years. Um, the good news is for the, the smaller ones, under a billion in assets, there has been progress. They're up to about a third now, at least of our respondents. And um, I will not pretend, unlike our later data, that this is a representative sample. Uh, this is self-selecting institutions who were interested in participating in our poll. Uh, if any of you all would like to be involved in these later on, please drop me a note. We'd be happy to do so. There's no obligation, not a sales pitch. Uh, you do get access to the data, though. Um, so still a lot of progress to be made here, we think. So let me now shift into what is some really interesting data. As an, as an analyst, you know, as I just referred to, we get very often sample sizes of a broader population. And we have to extrapolate with margins for error as to what's going on in that entire population. Here with this set of data, we have gone out with our partner company, FI Navigator, uh, and assessed the mobile offerings of every one of the over 6,000 institutions, banks and credit unions in the US who offer a mobile experience. Um, the data spans three years. Uh, we have some pretty interesting metrics I'll go into in some detail. Um, and I, I think that for, for me, being able to say with a fairly high degree of certainty that this applies to the whole population is pretty extraordinary. How did we do this? This is, um, for you all, kind of an, an example of some of the insights that a data analysis exercise can, can bring. So FI Navigator has gone out and used a whole host of different sources, um, whether it is analyzing individual institutions' websites, uh, gathering in regulatory data, going to the app stores to get customer reviews, um, sucked all this in together, uh, used its proprietary algorithms to match these things to institutions to figure out which vendors are serving which banks and credit unions, um, put together estimates of enrolled customers and installed base, um, and given a great snapshot over time of what's going on in the mobile banking market. So if you're interested about what your competitors are doing or what the state of adoption is, this is a great way to get up to speed and get informed. So, what are financial institutions doing with mobile? Um, and I'll do this throughout, I'll give you the key points. So, first of all, it's not necessarily as widespread as you thought. As far as I could tell, most every institution here does offer mobile. Um, nationwide, it's still at 85.7%. So there are 14% of institutions, over 100 million, that don't offer a, a mobile app. And when you get below 100 million, only 29.3% of them offer mobile, uh, which I think, you know, to, to be Captain Obvious, that's gonna be a problem for them. Now, what's also interesting, if you control for size, credit unions are generally more likely, although the gap is closing, to offer a mobile app. And size is correlated with how early a, an institution offered mobile. And again, makes intuitive sense. Credit unions, 
we're quicker to embrace mobile, but the, the banks are closing the gap pretty rapidly, and we'll, we'll see that illustrated in just a bit. So the lead you had is shrinking, and that narrowing is, is driven by this growth of 85% of banks between 100 million and 100 billion, twice the growth rate of credit unions since 2013. So let me flesh this out for you. Um, you know, if, if you look at banks, uh, every one of them over 100 billion offers a mobile app, not surprisingly. On the credit union side, of the five biggest credit unions, there's one that actually doesn't offer a mobile app. Um, it's SECU in uh, North Carolina. And apparently they are in every little town and they don't yet offer a mobile app. And I'll just leave that there. And you can see there's pretty good penetration throughout uh, until you get to these really small institutions who don't have the wherewithal or the inclination, apparently, to offer mobile at this stage. Now, what we've also done is break this out by banks versus credit unions to look at the average age for a mobile app. And that's what the bars represent. As you can see, it's a pretty good correlation with size and with age. Um, and just in terms of early adoption and who's going to be out there innovating. Now here's the historical trend, and the credit unions are on the top here. So you've got now overall, and this is between 100 million and 100 billion, um, or for credit unions, over 100 million, you've got 92.6% penetration, um, up from 66 three years ago, three and a half years ago. Um, banks are closing that gap, but they still, they still have a long way to go, and again, I'm still, frankly, a little surprised there are 17% of the banks of this size who don't have a mobile banking app. Now, on the customer utilization, and this is you know, your end users, your depositors, this is where there was some big surprises for me, frankly, and so I'll give you the highlights. Um, not surprisingly, customer utilization is correlated with asset size and with mobile banking age. And since those two are already correlated, what it basically means is that the longer your app has been around, the more customers have adopted it because there's, they've just had greater exposure to it, word of mouth has gone around, um, your marketing messages have tended to sink in, and adoption goes up. There's really not much difference uh, between banks and credit unions on when you control for size. Um, the asset or the utilization of customers, so how often customers are actually using mobile banking has slowed. There's a, a plateauing, and the rate of growth, you know, B of A notwithstanding, um, of mobile adoption is slowing down. And in fact, I've had a couple of different banking clients, both here and abroad, who've called us up and said, look, we, we don't see the growth in mobile banking that we were expecting or that we, we want. What can we do about it? And that's a conversation for another day. But the, the, the low-hanging fruit, the easy pickings, have slowed down. The, the other interesting thing, um, and this is just some proof for, again, what would seem intuitive, is that the more features that you offer to your customers means the more customers you get enrolling in mobile banking. And part of this is what can explain the differences in enrollment among different customer classes, uh, among different institution size classes. So let me flesh this out again for you. So customer utilization, and there are a different, number of different ways to measure this, um, whether it's uh, lifetime installs of the app or customers actually enrolled. So the, the numerator will change. We'll just focus on enrolled customers to accounts, and the accounts is deposit accounts. Um, generally pulled in from regulatory data. So overall, if you look down on the bottom left, the grand total of bank enrolled customers to accounts is only 20%. And at credit unions, it's 16.2%. So, and it goes down from there. I mean, the biggest even are only at 26.7%. So there's an immense room to improve on that. There are a lot of customers who aren't yet enrolled, who can be enrolled, to improve the customer experience, to reduce costs, 
achieve all of those potential goals that we talked about up at the beginning. For me, that, that again is surprisingly low because I think if you live in the, the hype bubble, you think that everyone's on mobile except for your mother-in-law. Uh, and that is not the case. And security is the number one reason cited, um, but there are a host of other reasons as well. And I think um, if you believe that getting your customers onto mobile is a good thing, uh, you should make efforts to do that. And we can talk about that later on. So this is historical utilization graphically. Um, we did not have the greater than $100 billion banks, the mega banks, in that last chart. Here they are graphically at the top line. Even for them, we're at 37.1% in terms of enrollment. So they've still got almost two-thirds of their customers who are not mobile banking. Um, so a huge opportunity, we think, despite all the hype. Now, what mobile features are out there? We have a, a few key points. First of all, um, Basic banking f features, and I'll tell you what those are, are very widely adopted, and there are five top ones we'll talk about. And after that, it kind of drops off a cliff. Um, asset size generally dictates or generally predicts how many features are going to be offered. Payments, which is a huge area of opportunity, the functionality varies really widely. Um, bill pay and mobile deposit are most popular, not, not surprisingly. But again, a lot of room for improvement. Um, an area of big opportunity, we think, is support and information features, as well as fraud management. Uh, they are underrepresented almost across the board, and I'll, I'll show you that in some more detail. Um, and because of the benefits, both for customers and for the banks and credit unions, I'll, I'll go to JP's disclaimer on banks and credit unions now. Um, we, th we think that that presents a really compelling area for improvement. And when Citi, on its corporate side, says it's getting rid of dongles to go with, among other things, mobile and biometric authentication, uh, we think there is a lot of opportunity on the retail banking side to enlist the mobile as a fraud management device. Um, we have also looked at what came in at uh, most popular new ads. Quick Balance um, was the one most added. Who, who here offers Quick Balance? You know, you can, that's a pretty good number. Um, quick Balance, of course, is where you can get your balance without actually having to log in, and you have to give it permission once up front, and then you're, you're all set. Um, and finally, just to give you a sense of the greatest hit of a year ago, that was Mobile Deposit, uh, most added over the last 12 months. Uh, who here has Mobile Deposit? Okay, so you guys are another self-selecting group, clearly. Uh, you're here at this conference, and you're pretty advanced in what it is that you offer. So here are all the features that we track. And you can see that the top five of viewing account balances, intra-bank account transfer, transaction history, bill pay, and ATM locators were all over 80%. Next one after that is mobile deposit at essentially two-thirds. And then it drops down into the 20s. So quick balance, account alerts, P2P payments, search transaction histories are in the 20s, a couple in the teens of viewing check images and fingerprint authentication, which again, um, hugely convenient. Uh, I do have to tell you, when I first joined Selen four and a half years ago, I would be at a, a party and someone would say, what do you do? And I'd say, well, I research banking technology. And they're like, I'm going to the bar. And I would never see them again. Um, that has changed. Um, banking technology is impinging on the mainstream, and people actually engage, and they will say, oh, that depositing a check on my phone is magic. Or, you know, I, the, the entering of the pin, you know, four, four taps, I thought it was no big deal, but now that I have fingerprint authentication, I love it. Um, so features like that, I think, are really potentially low-hanging fruit for you all to consider adding. Uh, and there are a host of other ones down here. Um, this is a good overview slide. I'm going to go into this in a bit more detail. So as we looked at banking, basic banking, um, we went through this. I tend to focus on the grand total, but these are 
view in the account balances, transaction history and the like. Um, surcharge free ATM locators, only 6.6% actually offer that. And I guess I get it. But if you're trying to improve your customer experience um, and someone's already not going to be banking on you, why not help them out? 6.6% of the institutions are doing that. So on the enhanced banking category, um, searching transaction history, 22.1% globally. But viewing check images, viewing statements uh, offered by very few. Personal financial management, 5%. Rewards management, even lower. So if, as I think we've kind of agreed by consensus or acclamation that improving the customer experience is a lot better, all these are relatively straightforward implementations to add to the arsenal. Other features, quick balance, uh, just over a quarter now. Fingerprint authentication, I mentioned, uh, only 13%. But of the biggest, the, leader, the leaders, 75% offer it. Um, cardless cash, uh, one bank currently is offering it of the biggest, but still just 0.1%. Uh, again, if you want people to start thinking about mobile wallets, if you want to get them engaged, cardless cash is a, a great way of doing it. And that's where you don't need your cash. You just initiate an ATM transaction on your phone. And there are a variety of ways of actually making it happen. Um, but B of A is certainly rolling it out. Um, some of the big vendors have this functionality. Um, I personally think it's, it's pretty nifty. And anyone here offer cardless cash, by the way? No, that's more, um, I, I'm on my banking app, and I'm going to the ATM, and I say I want to withdraw 100 bucks, and I can do that without having a card. I just do it with my phone. Um, on the payment side of things, uh, what's highest is bill pay um, and mobile deposit, not surprisingly. Uh, and again, you can see that the biggest institutions tend to offer more of these. P2P payments are at 22%. Um, and that is, again, uh, on the rise. And in particular, with the advent of Zelle, we think we'll see more of that uh, occurring. But things like, for opportunities, um, credit card management and prepaid card management, again, huge areas we think that, that are really underserved right now, underexplored. Uh, under offered and as a way of improving the customer experience we think pretty nifty fraud management i mean just again the bigs have got things like account alerts and it's fairly popular but debit card on off um, there are some out there who are advertising it it's pretty interesting um, can be very worthwhile for consumers um, but not a lot of people are offering it right now uh, getting your replacement card if you've somehow lost it. Travel notifications. Uh, if someone travels a lot and they de get declined, why, why decline them? Why not send them a text um, right there? Well, first of all, you can let them turn it off, say they're going to start traveling, and then pre-clear them. But you know, honestly, whoever does that? Um, it, it is such a pain. Why not just when you're at this new location, send them a text and say, hey, are you actually in Singapore? Uh, do you authorize this transaction and your phone's with you and the likelihood of your phone and your card being um, lost simultaneously is low and if you can, resp or hacked, you just say yes and the transaction goes through. Uh, stop payment, not offered. I think all these are interesting things to explore if you're going to uh, improve the customer experience. Now the support and information, very low across the board. Click to call live chat that's improving scheduling appointments. Uh, you know, a quarter of the big banks have it, but very low elsewhere. Uh, social media reordering checks, current rates, credit score. Um, I suspect credit score we're going to see a lot more of. Um, again, great customer service kind of uh, offer. But just incredible white space here. Huge opportunities to better serve your customer and, and your member and improve that customer experience. So on the leaderboard, uh, what, what have we seen over the last 12 months, uh, ending in September 2016, Quick Balance was the most added new feature, followed by fingerprint authentication, mobile deposit, 
uh, P2P payments and the debit card off on. So it's kind of the greatest hits. Um, a year ago, mobile deposit was the most popular. Um, and then it's gone up from 59% up to 67%. So um, bill pay, fingerprint authentication. Um, so the usual suspects, a lot of traction here. But just because it's not being added, doesn't, it actually does mean that it's a way for you to differentiate if you add some of those other features and let people manage their lives via their mobile. So feature lift is, is pretty interesting. Uh, I will say, because all you guys do data, this is going to be correlation, not causation. Uh, but still, I think, has some interesting insights. So what we've done is say, if uh, this feature is present on a mobile app, what is the utilization of that app or that institution's app relative to institutions who don't have that feature? Um, and we can, again, measure by a couple of different ways. We just focus on one, the um, enrolled customers in this presentation. There's a correlation between the number of features you offer and customer enrollment. Um, and offering these new features does not come free. I mean, there's a cost associated with it um, in terms of marketing it, in terms of getting it installed, testing it, all the, li the, the rest. Um, this can potentially help you prioritize what your next functions should be. Um, I'll show you in just a second. Bill pay and mobile deposit are associated with the highest feature lift. Um, fingerprint authentication and account alerts are there, but they're not as widely adopted, so it's tough to show there's as much of a feature lift. But on the subject of, of um, just customer experience, the notion of alerts and telling people things that they don't know but should know um, is another great way to add value. Um, and it's pretty low cost with technology today. So thinking about those instances where you can surprise a customer, surprise a member up front, um, I think is, has the potential to really be one of those aha moments where they realize, ah, my credit union has done something for me that is really valuable, and they're not even asking for anything right now in return. So we looked across all the features um, that had feature lift. Bill pay was the highest uh, at 173%. And rather than focusing on the absolute numbers, it's better just to think, I, I think, look at the rank order. So bill pay, then fingerprint authentication, mobile deposit, account alerts, P2B payments, rewards management, um, you know, PFM, those that offer it, not very high feature alert. I like looking down at the bottom. So this is just a set of those features that are correlated with higher usage. Now, customer satisfaction, we did this via the app stores, uh, which is, I will admit, a very blunt instrument. Um, and, and you'll see this. Uh, as we look at the data, there's no correlation with asset size on these. Um, credit unions had a slightly higher overall app rating. Um, there was up to a point where it flattened off a correlation between increased number of features and satisfaction or rating in the app store. Um, this is kind of ominous. The mega banks were the only ones to increase in satisfaction over the last three years. And credit unions have seen a decline in their app store average uh, while banks have been increasing. So again, your, your competition now because of technology is no longer just your local other credit unions or community banks. Um, it can be some of the, the nationals uh, as the main point of contact becomes the mobile for more people, and as mobile adoption slowly, but I think surely continues to increase, uh, your competitive set has gotten bigger, and you've got to be paying attention to what it is the biggest ones out there are, are doing. Um, and I will confess that although I have some credit union relationships, and I'm very promiscuous financially, um, uh, my main bank is Bank of America, in part because they gave me uh, a mortgage on the strength of an offer letter uh, 20 plus years ago, or a predecessor bank is, I'll be clear, and so inertia set in. 
but also, you know, objectively speaking, their mobile app is really good, and there are enough ATMs around that I can avoid ATM fees. And, um, you know, like in behavioral economics, I will tell you that ATM fees are perhaps the biggest source of friction, along with parking tickets, between me and my wife. And I see it, I see that three bucks on a statement, and I go nuts, and I, I'm getting better. It's taking me days longer every time it happens. Um, and I just cannot help myself. I know it's going to be a bad thing, and I'll wait, and I'll wait a few days, and I say, oh, what about that ATM fee? And she says, look, I know you hate them, and you know I'm desperate if I do it, and if I could just keep my mouth shut over three bucks, it would cause so much less strife, but I can't do it. So, and, and credit unions might not help me there either. So what I've got to do is get my wife the Schwab card where they've forgiven fees forever, um, to their chagrin. Anyway, um, satisfaction is, is important. So we've looked at this. You know, frankly, this is not that interesting. There's not that much difference here. Um, you know, the, the littles, I think, is interesting. You know, 3.93 versus 4.29 over the biggest. Uh, and the biggest do have the highest satisfaction ratings. They've, they've gotten their act together, and they are pouring enormous resources into their mobile offerings right now and into omni-channel as well. So here's the historical trend, and this is what's a little ominous. When it started out, or we started out with this data in 2013, banks were significantly below credit unions, and banks just in September closed the gap, and credit unions have been declining a little bit. And what you were, I mean, think about your life three years ago. What was a great app then is now really terrible. <laughs> so um, my suspicion here is that credit unions have kind of rested on their laurels and maybe not invested or upgraded as much, whereas the banks have been spending more time on making their apps a lot better than they were. And the other thing about satisfaction, of course, is part of it is based on expectations. So if you and I, and I hate those questions, were your expectations met? Well, my expectations at a Holiday Inn are a lot different from the Ritz, and if they're met at both places, doesn't mean it was the same customer experience. So um, expectations play a role in this, but it's really tough to tease out. So historically, uh, what's interesting here, the bigs in the dark blue are now at the top of the customer satisfaction. So the B of A's and the, the U.S. banks and the Chase and the Wells, they have for the first time in the end of, or the third quarter of 2013, 2016, risen to the top. Whereas here for the smallest ones, they have really taken a nosedive. So for those institutions in particular, we'd think that's a wake-up call. Um, who here monitors their, their App Store ratings? It's pretty good, but not by any means unanimous. I'd say that's maybe 40% is a rough guess. Um, so that's useful to do. It's a way to listen to your customers, obviously. All right, market share. This is market share of the vendors out there. Um, get another unscientific poll. Who here has the mobile app that is provided by your core provider? Wow. Okay, good. You Again, an advanced group. Very few. So here's, here are the key points. First of all, um, we slice this a bunch of different ways. I'm just going to focus on one of these. Um, Fiserv in the credit union space is the 800-pound gorilla, and it was solidified with our acquisition of ACI. Um, on the bank side, there's a lot of consolidation. The top three vendors are, are at almost 70% share by institution count, not by customers, but by institution count. On the credit union side, it's a lot more fragmented. The top three only have 42% market share by institutions. And, and finally, we can flip that around and look at enrolled customers instead of institution sizes, and there's only one significant size, uh, change in the top five, um, and that's Monetize replacing Jack Henry because Monetize has some really big banks with really large customer bases. Um, and just by illustration, it ranks 29th by, by FI client count. 
Um, and Fiserv is there with three out of 10 institutions as uh, three out of 10 actually customers in the US using a Fiserv mobile app. So on the client count side, so number of credit unions that they serve, uh, Fiserv is number one by a lot with 529. Then Access Softech and NCR Corp. Um, but again, a lot of other firms out there with a lot of different offerings, including the others at 468. So this goes down to um, almost 50 vendors today. Uh, there is a wide variety of partners to choose from. So let me wrap up with some very high level advice. And I've sprinkled some in here and there. But first of all, increase your adoption. Um, you know, if you have any kind of halfway decent app, it is a way for you to be engaged with your customers, sorry, with your members a lot more often um, than otherwise. And it may cost you a little bit more, but if your goal is to improve the customer experience and to develop a closer relationship with your members, mobile adoption is a great way to do that. Think about what features you want to adopt. I identified some that I think are gaps, um, and certainly if they're not being offered by many institutions. It is a way for you to differentiate yourself if you can start to let them do things like manage uh, their cards, manage their travel, get fraud alerts, take care of their life from their mobile. And that has to play out with your strategy. But if, if your strategy is, in fact, to improve customer relationships, give a better customer experience, this is a great way to do it. And you, of course, you can't just put them out there and expect people to find them. You've got to have an intentional strategy as you roll them out to make people aware and get them to use it. And finally, you know, the average contract uh, based on turnover, and there's some churn rate data that I have that we didn't show you, is kind of around three years. And a, a lot of folks are bumping up against that. Um, with the wide variety of vendors out there who've done an immense amount of work on usability and features and the rest, if you're up toward the end of the contract, don't just, no matter who it is, don't just re-up. Go out and, and do the due diligence, see what's out there, see what terms you can get, and see what the experience is. I, I know at least one of you is, has just gone through that process um, because I think you'll be pretty pleasantly surprised. So with that, I'm very happy to, to take questions. Please. Is there a mic here? Phil, well, I can hear you. They can't hear you. So we'll go up. So from the uh, last presentation, we know we have the chasm, and then we have the horizons. And this seems like it's like the second horizon, but it's moving. It'll soon be the, the norm with all the adoption. And this is what you do. So what do you think you'll be doing in like three to five years? What's the next next? Thing. I mean, you must have an opinion or some insight. Well, so, so here's my, here are a couple of potential scenarios. Um, and these aren't predictions, but these are, are what ifs. So one is, what if the banking app just goes away? You know, we heard yesterday that 98% of apps um, are one and done. Um, what if you don't actually have to open your banking app anymore? So either you can just do it via web or you say Siri, or Alexa, or Google Home. Um, Siri, pay my utility bill, or pay the water bill. And it says, OK, Dan, uh, and it's done. And it's kind of like Uber. I set it up once, and, and, and my Amazon account, and I set it and forget it. And I don't even open up my B of A app or open up B of A online. It's just all done through Siri, who's interacting all in the background and knows what bill I'm talking about and knows what's happening with the bank. Um, so I think that's one um, potential scenario. The, the other is if someone gets their act together, um, they've essentially just got a, a PFM front that will go to different banks, different institutions, and aggregate everything together. Uh, we're, we're calling that personal financial experiences, not 
PFM, which uh, at 10 or 12 percent adoption just has never taken off, in part because it's not that great. I mean, the, I, uh, the, uh, the, the iPod was not the first MP3 player, but they were the first one to get the whole ecosystem right and make it easy and um, get adoption to take off because of that. And for someone who spent time in college uh, taking a song from one piece of vinyl and another and making mixtapes on my Maxell UDXL 120s, um, you know, it's now magic that with one click I can get a song. But you know, the difference from going from five clicks down to two is huge. Uh, it's really tough to engineer, but it increases usability. So I think that there will be um, a lot of progress in usability and the user experience. And the question is, are banks going to be part of that and recognized for adding value? Or are they going to get shoved to the background where they're just someone, someone that happens to hold my money and is insured? Yeah, I, actually just a comment, um, because we're credit unions, we love you and your wife and we want to help you with your ATM fees. So if, if you knew there's 34,000 co-op ATMs and Bank of America has 16,000, so use your credit union card, we can help you out. I, and and I, I know that part, but the, the mobile apps that I have seen so far just aren't nearly as good. And that's my hang up. And that's my challenge back to you guys and your vendors. One over here. I think there's a mic coming right behind you. Thank you. They say our current president. Oh, they, they just cut you off as soon as you said that. <laughs> When should you start? 18 months out? Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think you should be constantly uh, reevaluating. Contractually, there may be things that you can and can't do. But having a roadmap is, um, I think, critical. Seeing what is available now, even if you might have to break a contract, is critical. Um, again, I spoke to someone who's undergoing a core conversion right now. You may not have to go all that way. And, you know, only 15% of our respondents said they were thinking about that, but the whole um, middleware layer that you can potentially put in to mediate between the core and the demands of real time um, and these demanding customers is, is huge. So even if you're, I mean, I think you should be reevaluating right now versus best in class uh, and make it an ongoing kind of process. I mean, easy for me to sit here and say you guys have the hard job of actually making it happen. Have you done any research or have any numbers around the perception from members, customers on multiple apps? So, for instance, a main primary mobile banking app and then a payments app to manage some of the other features that are listed. Yeah, it, it's interesting. We haven't done um, that exact assessment anecdotally, things like Venmo. Um, I don't know, has anyone gone out and looked at the Venmo.com feed? It's it's great entertainment as you see what people are, are paying for. Um, but I think that you know, anecdotally that kind of experience um, is something to watch out for. Um, and it's, again, the, the great thing about data analytics is you can actually measure what people do, not what they say. Um, and they vote with their feet and their, their wallets. Um, Zell is going to be very interesting to see how much adoption it gets and whether it can track people uh, or attract people away from Venmo. Um, but I, you know, I think if if the goal, like my my cocktail party, was to get people engaged in this payment stuff, um, folks like Venmo uh, have got a leg up right now on incumbent institutions uh, because they're putting a little bit of fun into it. Uh, and it goes all the way to non-technical stuff. I mean, the branding and the tone you use with your customers. Uh, and when I went out and opened two dozen deposit accounts, uh, the change or the, the differences in tone across these institutions were striking. Um, you know, so one mobile-only app, when I 
got everything done successfully, said, huzzah, you've now opened your account, um, which you know, Citibank or any of the bigs would never do. They were much more corporate and they were you know, wearing their virtual suit. Um, so we haven't looked at that, but I think you know, anecdotally there is a, a big difference in perceptions about this. JP showed some of those, um, but I think certainly among your, your current member base and your target member base, it's worth doing that kind of investigation. We have a question from the audience. Um, how to overcome the challenge of mirroring the mobile experience uh, to same as the online experience? <laughs> Um, well, the, the end game there is that you've just got the same source for all the data and all the experiences, and ideally you're just doing responsive design so that all the branding and all the experience looks and feels the same, although on the mobile you'll be seeing a lot less than you will on the screen. Um, you know, to get from here to there, um, is a lot tougher. Uh, the num and, and I like First Tech's slide yesterday where they listed all the different vendors they had to interface with. Um, but you know, I, th I think of it, you know, technically, you, you want to have um, you know, ideally responsive design. If not, you've got to have a lot of meetings between the online folks and the, the mobile folks. Um, and we've actually, in other surveys, asked how often these things happen for those who still have different groups doing it. And the general trend is moving to a digital group, so these folks are sitting next to each other. Um, but if there are different groups, they've got to talk a lot and make the experience the same. And you know, I, I fly a lot, and the experience of you know, buying my ticket on Delta.com versus selecting my seat or reselecting on the way to the airport versus being on board and interacting with the the flight attendants who, by the way, kind of like at banks, are some of the lowest paid employees, but they're the ones interacting most with the customers. Um, and, you know, God forbid if I check a bag, picking up the bag, all those things are very different experiences, but I know that I'm at Delta. And I think no matter what a member is doing with you, having that, that brand experience reinforced at every touch point is a huge part of, of omni-channel. Um, and so if they've got the same, uh, kind of the same cadence in the interactions on mobile and on online, um, that's great. I mean, I think there are some things that are different. You don't want to, if you can possibly help it, have anyone entering any text on mobile, if at all. So to the extent possible, pre-fill things and say, is this right? Give them buttons, not, not form fields to, to enter. Um, you know, get away from, even online, the notion of just taking a paper form and sticking it up there on, on the screen. Um, you know, have, um, you know, there shouldn't ever be a, a line you leave blank because you should have branching technology that if it would go to a blank line, it just skips it. So reimagine even how they interact on that form side of things. So there's, you know, a whole range of things on customer experience, but, you know, you got to have the right hand knowing what the left hand is doing, ultimately. One over here. Um, Bill Dodds from uh, Wistera and Denver. Um, what is the average number of apps a consumer has with m multiple financial institutions? We think that the typical customer, based on our research, has four. Um, so in other words, no one is using just one bank. Most organizations, most consumers are using multiple organizations. Is that what your research shows as well? Or yeah, and I don't have the exact numbers, but yeah, that that um, is in fact true. The the question is, you know, what are they using them for, and who is their primary bank, um, and who gets the the most look at the data, um, and and. Also, as we look around the world, it, it varies widely by country. So in Japan, actually, I happen to know that figure. It's seven banks they happen to have relationships with. And um, it is, 
because of the way they do not just their mental accounting, but they actually translate mental accounting into physical accounts. Um, so, you know, even if you're the primary bank, it, it does raise the, the challenge, oh, I've just seen something better over here at, at bank number two, why can't bank number one do it? Maybe I'll switch. Um, and maybe they'll make it easier. Although, you know, as of six months ago, and are you all familiar with the US, the UK uh, account switching protocol? So if, if you think uh, your regulators cause you problems, in the UK they are incredibly active and um, all these neobanks have um, been chartered and are springing up to challenge uh, the banks uh, because the regulator in the UK thinks there are, is too much concentration and customers are being underserved. Um, so they have they mandated the, the incumbent banks make it easy to switch. So I can go into my bank and, and say, Lloyds, um, I'm leaving you, I'm going over to HSBC, make it happen, and within a week they've got to transfer everything over there, including my standing orders. And you think, ah, there goes the friction. People will start switching now in droves, and yet they didn't. The pickup was maybe a point. Um, and you know, there are a variety of hypotheses. Mine is that um, Lloyd's, I hate you, but I know why I hate you. I'm pretty sure I'm going to hate you, HSBC, but I don't know why, so I'm going to stick with the devil I know. <laughs> um, which is really sad. But, um, I mean, you've got to really upset someone to get them to switch. But I think now, again, with you know, four plus or minus uh, banking apps right there that you use to varying degrees, you now have a better sense of what's available. Great, I think, uh, right, good. no questions? All right, thank you all very much.